Swedish procurement of military equipment before and during World War II regarding the armored forces and the air force. To understand Swedish rearmament before and during World War II, we need to go back to the Defense Act of 1925. And to understand that, we need to go back even further to 1914. During the first year of World War I, Sweden spent around 182 million Swedish kronor per year on its military. Skipping forward to 1925, it was supposed to be a new defense act, or it was a new defense act. The high expenditure during World War I and the apparent calm of the 1920s would logically see a decrease of the defense spending. The Social Democrats envisioned a long time of peace and that the armed forces only needed to maintain Swedish neutrality, meaning a reduction in the number of divisions from 6 to 3. Parts of the Liberals thought that the League of Nations and a general worldwide disarmament would not need a costly defense, meaning the number of divisions should be reduced from 6 to 4. The right-wing parties saw the Soviet Union as a sleeping giant and its temporary weakness after the Civil War were only temporary. They would not want to see any reduction at all. However, we should remember that this Defense Act reflected on the financial crisis Sweden had in between 1920 and 22. So that they wanted to reduce the armed forces cost is no surprising. It is just surprising how much they did. In the new Defense Act of 1925, they put the budget at around 120 million Swedish kronor per year, or about 35% less than 1914. And even that was finally cut down to around 107 million kronor. To structure the armed forces around this new, very tight budget, a number of actions had had to be taken. The number of divisions, a division in Sweden is usually called a fördelning, but it's about uh, equivalent to a division. They were cut down from 6 to 4. Cavalry companies were reduced by 70%. Infantry companies were reduced by 60% and a number of regiments were eliminated. The remaining regiments each lost one battalion, now having only two battalions instead of three, and upgrading equipment was more or less put on the back burner. So, skipping forward to 1936. The relative calm of Europe in 1925 had been replaced with a rearming Germany, a much stronger Soviet Union, and a general hardening of the international climate. The 1936 Defense Act would reflect this, as the defense spending was raised from 118 million Swedish kronor to 148 million Swedish kronor, an increase of about 25%, but still 35 million less than had been spent in 1914, and it was only 1.5% of the GDP, which is a very low number considering what was happening in the near, in the near area of Sweden at that time. The next Defense Act came in 1942, when the spending was set at 755 million Swedish kronor per year. But, of course, that was a war budget, and the 1936 one was not. The military budget had between 1936 and 1942 been increased in steps, and that rose steeply as war broke out. However, to put the previous defense acts into context, The 1925 Defense Act was 14% of the one from 1942. The 1936 Defense Act was only 19% of the same. 
However, there were some foresights in both the 1925 Defense Act and even more so in the one from 1936. The 1925 uh, Defense Act, with all its reductions, at least saw the intention of creating an armed force or an armored force. However, what that would look like, no one really knew. The Defense Act of 1936 and its relative modest increase at least saw the Air Force budget going from 11 million Swedish kronor to 28 million Swedish kronor per year. So, the Swedish armed forces got a higher budget. How did this reflect military material procurement? Let's start with armored warfare, or in another word, tanks. Sweden bought its first tank already in 1921, and that was a French Renault FT tank with a 37mm gun that they bought for 37,000 Swedish kronor. It was not a very successful tank. About a third of the ammunition bought with the tank fi- uh, failed to fire. And during the uh, exercises in 1923-24, even more problems were discovered. So in the end, the tank war was destroyed in 1926. In 1922, they bought 10 LK-2 tanks with twin machine guns in secret from a German firm called Uge. They paid around 200,000 Swedish kronor. Interestingly, interestingly enough, the first down payment was done by Captain Walter Elliott, and he did it as a private person and not as a representative of the army. This was probably a way to avoid the Versailles Treaty that forbade Germany from having tanks. These tanks were in service until 1939. During the 20s and 30s, a number of foreign tanks were bought and tested, but none really met the Swedish requirements. In 1931, the first Swedish-built tank was built by Landsverk. It was designated FM-31, where FM stands for test model, or in Swedish, försöksmodell. Interestingly enough, it both had road wheels and tracks and you could switch very quickly between the two. But it was obsolete when it was finally delivered in 1935. Another tank was also produced by the same company, designated M31. It was an 11-ton tank with a 37mm gun and the three were delivered in 1935. It had some problems, like the tracks would often snap, in snowy conditions the tracks would get jammed. Other negative uh, things with this uh, tank was that you had to buy a lot of spare parts from abroad. However, this did not stop the purchase of other foreign tanks. Towards the end of the 30s, the need for tanks had grown ever more urgent and they set aside 5 million Swedish kronor to for tank procurement. Uh, in Czechoslovakia they found a tankette that could be bought for a good price, and in Sweden it was named uh, Stridsvagn M37 or Tank M37. It weighed around 5 tons, and it was armed with two machine guns. In total they bought 46 tanks, with an extra two tanks offered for 84,000 Swedish kronor, which they bought. All of the tanks were licensed built in Sweden, except the two extra tanks. They were delivered directly from Czechoslovakia. Landsverk also made the L60 tank during this time, with several versions that were used by the Swedish army. The first version being the M38, and 16 tanks were supplied by 1939. It was a tank with a a 37mm gun also. And that was actually the 
last tank to be delivered before World War II broke out. Sweden still had a great need for tanks. The only real tank in 1939 was the M38, and the country only had 16 of those. Now, as war broke out, it became increasingly hard to acquire war materials from abroad. In 1940, negotiations were far underway for Sweden to buy an additional 90 Czech tanks for 23 million Swedish kronor. But after the Germans invaded Denmark and Norway, the deal fell through. Uh, Germany did suggest that Sweden Sweden could buy 40 German tanks if Sweden would produce spare parts for the tanks and send them to Germany. In a way that Germany could actually have spare parts made out of harm's way. But that suggestion was rejected by Sweden. So all possible external sources seemed exhausted and only domestic production was available. Landsverket got an order for 20 new tanks, the M39 based on the L-60 tank, and they started arriving in 1940. Soon another order for a hundred more tanks, designated M-40, based on the same L-60 design, with a 37mm gun, was ordered for 20 million Swedish kronor. They started coming into service during 1941 and 1942. Meanwhile, You remember those 90 Czech designed tanks that Sweden could not buy? Well, Germany used them during uh, Operation Barbarossa, their designated Panskampfwagen 38. However, Sweden were allowed to license build them. The Swedish version weighed 9.5 tons, had a 37mm gun and was designated M41. 116 such tanks were ordered from the Swedish company Scania Vadis for a total cost of 18 million Swedish kronor. When extra equipment were included, the final cost 25 million Swedish kronor. At the same time as the M41 was discussed, they started talking about a heavier tank. The M42 was a 22.5 ton tank with a 75mm gun, and it was developed by Landsverk. Originally this tank was designed for the Hungarian army, there named Lago, but it was redeveloped for Sweden. In the first batch they ordered 160 tanks. In total they bought 282 tanks of different variants. The cost for tank procurement during the war was 170 million Swedish kronor and with all extra cost included, it ended up being around 200 million Swedish kronor. The expansion of the Air Force 1936 to 1939. The acquisition of new planes were an absolute priority, and that is reflected in, in the part of the budget used for procurement of new aircraft. In 1926-27 that was just under 65% of the budget, but by 1939 almost 80% of the budget were for procuring new aircraft. The Defense Act of 1936 saw the Air Force as the clear winner, as some 6-7 new Air Force wings were to be created. But what should they be equipped with? In 1937, the Saab company was started, a step towards a larger domestic aircraft industry. But designing and building new planes take time, and the Air Force needed something quickly, and they needed something modern. The money started flowing. The budget for procurement in 35-36 had been only 6 million Swedish kronor. In 36 to 37, it was already at 16 million Swedish kronor, and by 1938-39, it was up to almost 28 million Swedish kronor. When World War II broke out, this budget would be multiplied many times. Back to 1936. 
the Air Force had a mix of older fighter biplanes. The oldest was probably the Phoenix D3, which was based on the design used in World War I. The newest planes were from 1930, a mix of biplanes, among them the Swedish-produced Arrow Jaktfalka and the imported Bristol Bulldog II. They had about 29 of those plane, planes, and they were the newest but totally inadequate for war. The bombers were not much better off. Uh, they had 5 Fiat BR from 2425 and 11 attack planes FMV Phoenix C1 from 1921, but actually based on a 1918 design. Directly they got some new money, they bought some new planes. In 1936-37 they purchased 55 Gloucester Gladiators, Mark I and Mark II, that were delivered in 38, and they were designated J8. J stands for fighter in Swedish. To augment the bomber force, they looked first towards Germany and the play JU-86K. In 1936 they bought 40 planes and later built 16 additional planes on license in Sweden. This plane was designated B3. B stands for bomber. They also had Hawker Hart, first used as a reconnaissance aircraft named S7. S stands for reconnaissance. But it was later used as a bomber. Some few were directly bought from England, but most were built under license in Sweden. It was designated as B4, Bomber 4. Another bomber started to be built under license in Sweden, the American Northrop 8A1. In 1938 they bought one plane and 40 were ordered to be built under license in Sweden. In the end, some 102 planes were built under license, and the first reached frontline service in 1940. This uh, bomber was designated B-5. As you can see, it was a disproportionate number of bombers versus fighters. And the idea behind this, back then they thought that the fighters would not be able to find the bombers, so rather than to send fighters against bombers, they would send bombers against the enemy bombers' airfields and bomb them. So, however, they started to expand and try to get some new planes. Most were not that great. They weren't really, maybe not obsolete, but they were at least second rate by uh, the time World War II broke out. Let's jump to 1939 to 1945. The budget for procurement in 3940 was 122 million Swedish kronor. In 1940-41 it reached its peak 221 million Swedish kronor for procurement. Between 41-42 until 44-45 they spent between 137 to 188 million Swedish kronor per year in procurement. This was not only for aircraft, but it's all the procurement for the Air Force. As the war broke out, the Air Force realized it had to get more modern material. And as most of Europe were engaged in a war, you couldn't really get any planes from there. So the only option seemed to be USA, who was still uh, neutral. They could possibly supply all the fighters and bombers we needed. So in 1939 they placed an order for 120 fighters of a type Seversky Republic EP-1. Additionally 52 of the same planes were ordered, but in a bomber configuration. They also ordered 144 fighters of type VAL-T in US, it's US P-66 Vanguard, plus engines and other material for a total value of 57 million Swedish kronor. 60 fighters of the type Severski Republic EP-1 were delivered in Sweden designated J-9. 
as the rest of the planes did not get an export license from the USA. Probably they didn't get export license because Sweden was allowing German troops on leave to travel through Sweden. However, 60 good fighters, and it was a good fighter for its time, was not bad, but it was far from how many planes Sweden needed. So, now Sweden turned to Germany. Maybe they could get some planes from there. A first Swedish wish list were for 60 Messerschmitt 109, 36 Junkers 87, and 27 Heinkel 114C reconnaissance airplane. Uh, later they came up with an even longer list with German planes they wanted to buy. But all those lists turned into dust for one or another reason. They had imported some planes from Germany before the war, but not the fighters and bombers that they actually needed, the modern ones. So, the Swedish Air Force had to look to other countries to fill their need for fighters and bombers. After everyone had rejected them for one or another reason, they went to England, France, Germany, USA. The last country standing was Italy, which had a large rather large aircraft industry and it was not heavily involved in World War II as per yet. Italy was a bit scraping the barrel from Swedish point of view. It was not the first or even the third choice. But by 1940 they seemed to have no other choice. So between 1940 and 42, Sweden bought 84 Caproni ta 3 one three bombers. They were actually used as bombers and reconnaissance airplanes. Uh, designated B-16 and S-16. B-16 for bomber 16 and S-16 for reconnaissance plane 16. They also bought 72 biplanes of the type uh, Fiat CR-42 designated J-11 in Sweden and also 60 other fighters of the type Regiana RE-2000, designated J-20 in the Swedish Air Force. Some of these planes were actually very well liked, like the J-20, which was for a long time the fastest fighter in the Swedish Air Force. The J-11, the biplane, was also well liked, but the B-16, S-16, the Caproni bombers were not liked at all. For a time they had to be grounded after they found a combination of faulty manufacturing and error in handling and it had got the nickname the flying coffin because it crashed rather often. However, after an upgrade program was instigated, the plane again took off and flew more or less during the, the whole war. And that was more or less the end of imports of aircraft to Sweden during the war. Now it was up to the Sweden's domestic industry to step forward. And it did. The first Swedish plane was the Saab 17, designated in Sweden as B-17. It was a two-man bomber, able to carry 5 to 750 kilos of bombs with a max speed of 444 km per hour. 332 planes were delivered, and that happened between 1941 and 1944. Next came J-22, a fighter. It was a very competent low-level fighter that could hold its own in mock dog fights against a P-51 Mustang. Well, at least up to 5,000 meters. After that, it had no chance. It had a top speed of 590 km per hour, and in total 196 machines were built, but the last were not delivered until 1946. Next, the uh, Saab managed to deliver a light bomber, Saab 18 or B-18 S-18, bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. It was a twin propeller airplane that were both used as a bomber, as a ground attack aircraft, and as a reconnaissance aircraft. It had a top speed of 590 km per hour and a maximum bomb load of around 1.5 ton. 
a total of 245 planes were built and it entered service rather late, from 1944 to 1949. Finally came Saab 21, or the J-21, which was a fighter, but like many Swedish produced planes, they also served in other roles. However, in basic it was a single-seat fighter with a pusher propeller that gave it a top speed of 640 km per hour. Having a pusher propeller, it was one of the first planes equipped with an ejector seat. A total of 298 planes were produced and it entered service from 1945 until 1948. December 1945, so this is actually after the war, so one should probably not include it. By the end of World War II, Sweden had an air force that in quantity were around 600 active planes compared to the 160 they had in 1939. The quality had also started to reach a first-rate status, and the domestic aircraft industry would in the post-war years produce some very innovative fighters. This video became a little bit longer than I had expected, because I had also wanted to include the Navy the Navy who bought some destroyers, for example, from Italy during World War II. But uh, as this is a little bit long now, I will do that some other time. I hope you enjoyed it and have a nice day.